Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Turner. I'm one of the exec managers here at the Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network, and welcome to COVID Update 14? 13, sorry. So well briefed. 13. Thank you. So, as always, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting tonight and elders past and present and thank them for their ongoing stewardship of the country where we live and work. Tonight we've got a star-studded panel. We've got quite a lot of uh, presenters who are here ready and waiting for your questions. So tonight's focus is very much on um, the, the pandemic response that we've been working on for some months together and particularly with a focus on what will happen if there is an outbreak in a local residential aged care facility. So tonight's panel will be using uh, the work that we've been doing together as a group that is all uh, being documented in um, Health Pathways. The links for Health Pathways, I'm sure, will appear on Slido shortly if they're not there, and you can um, refer back to those at any time if you need to. So tonight we would ask you to uh, log on to slido.com and uh, put in the hashtag PHN13. <laughs> And that's where we'll be really keen for, to get your questions um, and to also have you complete the evaluation at the end of the night so we make sure that this series of events continues to meet your needs. So just a bit of background. So since March, a group of uh, clinicians and managers from right across the region have been working together to best prepare our um, local aged care facilities to manage an outbreak of COVID-19. The group has learned, as we all have, from outbreaks in other countries, in Sydney and now in Melbourne, and we continue to garner lessons from all of these places which increase our preparedness of the whole system to respond as one as needed. So the next phase of the preparation is tonight to give you some information about what the response uh, plan will be from Hunter, Lo Hunter New England Local Health District. So we'll hear from Dr Paul Craven, who's the medical controller at um, Hunter New England Local Health District, who's here with his colleague Liz Grist, who is the HASVAC at Hunter New England and, as well. And they'll tell us um, what it is that the LHD has planned to um, assist and to respond. Then we'll hear from Dr Jennifer Briggs, who's a local GP, who's been kind enough to spend quite a lot of time with the working group, um, helping us understand the GP perspective and talking to her colleagues and um, she's going to tell us about some of the work she's been doing and also some advice that she would have in this situation. Um, other people who are on the panel who are ready and willing to take questions are Carolyn Hullick, Dr Carolyn Hullick, who you will have seen before. Uh, Carolyn, as you know, works at the um, Belmont Emergency Department and has a, a passion for the care of older people. Uh, Dr Mark Lowenthal, who's an infectious diseases physician who will answer those hard clinical questions that... Hopefully we'll come to you, everyone's nodding over here. And also online tonight we have Tony Merritt who from the Public Health Unit. Uh, Tony tells us there is no new news from a public health perspective, which can only be good news, but is always um, is keen to answer any of the questions that you have. So tonight's the opportunity to ask the experts directly. Um, we will be really keen to manage those questions as they come and I know the panel are really keen to assist and answer. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Paul who's going to tell us about the pandemic response. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. I appreciate that. And tonight as I'm presenting, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'd also like to say that really I am presenting tonight about the Hunter New England response to COVID-19, but really I'm presenting on behalf of lots of people, so I'm just one voice on behalf of the whole of the executive team of Hunter New England who have worked as a great team together to ensure that our response is consistent with that of the community, with the primary health network as well. So thank you to everybody who's made this possible. So I, I, I start really by saying that we're not at the stage of cure and we're not at the start, uh, stage of our vaccine at this stage. So prevention is better than cure. And I just want to say that at this stage, it is really important to remember all those messages that come out on a daily basis about social distances, good hand hygiene and good cough etiquette. Because nowadays, obviously, where the where's Wally of the COVID era 
he's pretty e easy to find nowadays, okay, because Wally is well spaced and well social distanced. So I just want to say that the messages we get from our public health colleagues and the response that they have provided has been absolutely second to none. And it is important to socially distance because there is no expert on COVID-19 and there is no cure and there's no vaccine. As you can see, that is the true cure at this stage. <laughs> so I just want to present a little bit about the facts and figures. And when we say we have been preparing and working on COVID-19, every day we get a situation report from public health colleagues. And today, I'm pretty sure I looked at it today, and it's day 223. And every day of those 223 days, colleagues across the district, from the uh, local health district, all 17,000 people, have been working to ensure that the response within the local health district and through the community and with the primary health network together are ensuring that we're trying to prevent outbreaks of COVID-19 in the area. And when we have got outbreaks of COVID-19, to contain it early. I've given the facts and figures, they're as up to date as I could get, but there's probably about 25 million cases of COVID-19 across the world. I saw like yesterday there were 78,000 cases in India in one day. Huge numbers that we're seeing around the world. And it just reflects how well Australia is doing, but how much effort needs to go in to continue that all the time. In the brackets, I've just left the figures from June when I gave this talk to a Grand Rounds in Moree, and it was just the middle of June, there were 7 million cases around the world, and it just shows you the exponential spread of COVID-19 around the world. 25,000 cases in Australia from 7,000 previously in June, and really most of those cases, 95% of the cases recently have been down in Victoria. And we're now probably at over 502 uh, deaths, which I've written down there at the moment, but obviously the deaths have increased, and most of those deaths that we're seeing down in Victoria are the residents who've come from residential aged care facilities, which we'll talk about tonight. New South Wales response has been obviously different. We've had 3,851 cases. And again, that has been a slower response. And those response, the slower increase in numbers, have come from people who have been diagnosed when they've come back from overseas, local outbreaks where we know the source, and also outbreaks where we don't know the source, and that's obviously the most concerning at that stage. Tests have been performed across New South Wales. Over 2 million tests so far have been performed. And as I like to think about every single time, it's $100 for every test. That's an awful lot of money testing. But I will say it is money really well spent preventing admissions to hospital, which we can see happening in Victoria, and also the intensity of care people then require. For Hunter New England, we've had 297 cases, and we've had 17 cases since the 1st of June. And Tony knows a lot better than I do, but we've had about three local clusters of cases, all of which have been fantastically contained by our public health con colleagues working on containment measures to ensure there is no spread. We've had four deaths and over 122,000 tests. And I'm really proud to say that what we do on testing is we look at all areas across the district to ensure that we have good rates of testing which match the rest of New South Wales, especially when we have outbreaks in the community. As I said, we have had 223 days of planning and enacting our management plan because we did have wave one with a number of cases in wave one, but wave two to us has been more of a ripple at the moment and we're very happy to keep it that way and we plan to not see any second wave in New South Wales. To ensure we are prepared, every health facility across the district, 39 that provide care for patients, have got a pandemic plan. And in that pandemic plan, it is about how we'll manage patients walking through the front door of those facilities to ensure we can provide safe care, we have the right equipment, and we have the right staff. To ensure the staff are knowledgeable across the district and to ensure that we share information, accurate information, we all know the thousands of pieces of information that are now coming out, we have a COVID-19 website. It's a Hunter New England-based COVID website, but we are actually externalising some of the content this week so we can actually show people up-to-date information with the Department of Health, the Ministry of Health and the Clinical Excellence Commission as well. And on that website, we have nine categories of information we share on a regular basis. And that goes from information specific to healthcare workers, when they should be and shouldn't be working, infection prevention and control, the guidelines we have that are current, and we have over 80 guidelines developed just within Hunter New England alone. 
the testing criteria, which I know seem very easy now, but in those early days when people were travelling all around the world, and it depended whether you transited through one airport or another, I can tell you with those 17 initial versions of testing, it was very complex. We have information about pathology and testing and what swabs we need people to take and how we need to take them. We have information about signage and posters, which could be used throughout different health services. We have different resources for different specialties. And finally, we have information about contact tracing, public health and videos as well. So we have a lot of good information and we keep our website as a source of truth for people, the 17,000 people working within Hunter New England. So I guess the most important thing initially was to keep our services safe and to keep COVID out of our facilities because we don't want COVID obviously spreading. So when you go to a Hunter New England facility, all patients before they come in for outpatients, routine surgery or for a day procedure will have an SMS. And that SMS will ask them if they've had fever, if they've actually had epidemiological risk factors for COVID-19, and we'll ask them to reply, and we get about a 70% hit rate on replies to our SMS. If they don't um, reply back, we call them, and if they still don't answer the phone, which we know most people don't at that stage, we ask them before we actually let them in the facility as well. We also ensure we screen everyone coming through the front door for temperature, risk factors, and also whether they've been through those case locations of high risk that should be um, self-isolating and getting tests uh, um, regardless. We've also had periods where we've locked down the facility, periods where we've reduced visitor numbers, and periods where we've shared the information with residential aged care facilities across the district when information comes out from the ministry advising people to either reduce or stop visitors when there are local case spread and outbreaks. Um, at the moment, we are reduced to one visitor, and that is an ongoing process as we've had some local spread in the last few weeks. As you know, we went to Amber Alert, and that was just an Amber Alert for surgical mask wearing. And we wear masks now for 1.5 metres from the patient, or if you're a visitor coming into the, uh, the hospital. And for emergency, all patients are triaged for risks of having COVID-19. So we're looking for suspected or proven cases of COVID-19 as you appear in the emergency department, so we can actually care for them safely in the department and provide appropriate care and keep our staff safe at all times. A number of things have happened across Hunter New England and one of the first things was developing a dashboard which you've used as an executive. Um, the map that's on the uh, slide that you can all see is just pinpointing the outbreaks of COVID-19 across the district. What was really important about that is when we can see where the cases are in hospital, in home, in intensive care, we can actually map the testing rates in those regions to ensure that we are looking for COVID-19 in the community and ensure we're not missing any cases. And what we have been doing is looking at the rates per 10,000 or 100,000 of our population of COVID-19 swabs. We map it for every region or local government area across New South Wales. We look at that regularly, and we actually then, when we're actually dropping down our rates, use our media campaign to actually increase testing rates at that moment in time. So we have been trying very hard to contain COVID-19 in the community and public health have done a phenomenal job. Um, I have to say I have learned so much. Um, I think I'm a frustrated public health physician at some times, but containment is the way to go at the end of the day and have, they have done that extremely effectively. To match any outbreaks, however, the local health districts have popped up swabbing facilities in many locations. We've had 14 drive throughs and 39 facilities testing patients and we've had over 122,000 tests and also another 80,000 in private facilities. We've had over 200,000 swabs in Hunter New England already. We have changed our outpatients so we're now seeing about 40% of patients via telehealth. Most of our meetings like we are doing tonight are virtual and as I say we're using standardised guidelines to ensure that we're practising in a standard process to make sure the patients get the best care and also we keep the staff safe at all times. And most importantly, we have been working with the PHN on a regular basis to make sure our pathways are up to date and accurate and we look at all those pathways in addition to the guidelines to ensure they're aligned. And I put the word GP champion down there because it seems to be a bit of a buzzword at the moment and I use that buzzword because around processes of trying to manage outbreaks in aged care facilities there have been lots of people are talking about 
is there a GP who would be a champion for that facility if there was an outbreak? Finally, we do want to keep our staff safe. And we've had many helplines, wellness lines, and we've actually rolled the flu vax out in a record-breaking time this year. So I guess what we've had to do is look at outbreaks in high-risk settings. So and, and as much as we're going to talk about residential aged care facilities tonight, we have actually developed plans for aged care facilities, social housing developments, Aboriginal communities, including remote communities, and disability facilities across the district as well. And we are aware of other high-risk settings where there may be outbreaks, and we can see in the prison system, obviously, with what's happening in Queensland. So from the residential aged care facility preparation um, and also in the disability section, I have to take my hat off to the ACE service, who's done so much work in planning and holding regular webinars, meetings, training, infection prevention control for residential aged care facilities across the district and also to all those aged care facilities and also other attendees who've been attending those on a regular basis and learning and ensuring that their facilities are as prepared as they can be if there were an outbreak. What is obvious is that Hunter New England has the most aged care facilities. That's not a surprise. When you're in Hunter New England, you're used to saying that sort of thing. There are 150 aged care facilities. That's 17% of the state's aged care facilities are in this region. There is Department of Health documents. There are Ministry of Health documents. And there are CC documents. And we have developed a plan about an outbreak in a residential aged care facility based on all three of those documents. And we've worked with the ACE team to actually ensure that the aged care facilities have been surveyed to ensure they are compliant with where we'd expect them to be in their pre preparation. Thrilled to say that 100% of aged care facilities have got an outbreak management plan. What I am learning is it's probably not good enough just to have a plan, it's actually how you put the plan into action. Because a lot of the feedback I'm hearing, whether it's New March House, whether it's Victoria, or whether it's actually people running through their own scenarios, is having it written down on paper is not enough. Practicing is how you have to ensure that you can actually enact the plan. 100% of people had processes around hand hygiene, management of PPE, they all had PPE stores. Most places had a week supply if there was an outbreak in that facility. And all facilities had training on contact and droplet precautions. As you can see, there is a lot of data there, and they've collected that data. And what the ACE service has done is they've actually looked for the gaps um, across the district and ensured they've tackled those gaps. So people who initially didn't have a plan, they worked with them to actually develop the plans. 96% of the facilities surveyed had single rooms, so that's really important when we're thinking about how to isolate people who are testing positive in a facility at that time. One of the things I really would like to stress is 70% of facilities report they had involved the GP in the outbreak management plan. And I think that's really reassuring, but certainly when we presented last week in the New England region, a lot of the GPs did present back to say they would like to be more involved in understanding what the plans say. Because I think what happens is a lot of the plans from the district and a lot of the plans from uh, the local aged care facilities might have the word GP in there, but the communication back to the GPs might not have existed at that stage. 98% of um, aged care facilities are screening staff and residents before they're going in. And a lot of aged care facilities report they had good processes of handling waste, food, and also environmental cleaning. But again, when we listen to people providing feedback, they say in real life, when you actually have an outbreak and you've got to provide PPE for every resident and dispose of all that waste, they said it soon became out of control. And m many aged care facilities have reported a lot of difficulty actually getting rid of the waste, and we could see that happening in Victoria. So once again, working out how much you go through, where you'd actually um, dispose of that waste, and also how you handle food, because we recognise, obviously, the handling of a tray is a lot more complex than people make out at that stage. So I guess, what would the a a local health district do in supporting an aged care facility? We have a very detailed plan, and I think I can speak on behalf of Liz and myself and the, my other colleagues in the room tonight to say, we want to work with everybody if there was an outbreak. We're not going to be sitting down saying no. We are going to work as a team together. One of the things that we know we'll have to do is provide swabbing, 
There are many private swabbing firms out there saying that they can pick this up at that stage. But if there was a problem actually identifying someone to go in and do swabs for all the residents and all the staff, we would be able to find staff who could actually be a flying squad and go in and swab residents and staff in aged care facilities. We know that within an hour or two of an outbreak, the first person that generally knows is as soon as pathology know, they generally contact the public health unit and the public health unit will then contact the manager of the residential aged care facility who will then enact their outbreak management plan. They will start the contact tracing, isolation and cohorting of patients to ensure that we continue to keep pay, uh, residents in those facilities safe and well. And it's important to recognise that when you actually do diagnose someone with symptoms of COVID-19, they have been infectious for 48 hours prior to the actual test coming back. Within the first couple of hours, um, Hunter New England will hold a critical incident review meeting. And that meeting is to identify what the aged care facility, what the primary health network, what the local GP needs from the local health district. So in that meeting, it is structured, there are a set of questions, it will be run through by the Director of Clinical Governance, and it's to identify the current situation without all the details and what the local health district needs to do immediately to help support the aged care facility. And whether that's a flying squad of people to go in and start the swabbing, whether it's an infection prevention control staff member to actually go in and start looking at cohorting and look at infection prevention and control practices, whether it's health share to look at waste management and actually going in and actually supporting food handling and environmental cleaning, we will discuss that at that meeting and make a thorough plan. At the end of the whole process, maybe the next day or even six hours after we start, we would have another critical incident review meeting as a summary to ensure all processes discussed are actually in place. Things that the, the LHG has been asked on a regular basis is, can we help with infection prevention and control? And I think we can say yes in that respect. Obviously, 150 services across a large geographic region. It may be actually we are, have IPC into a residential aged care facility. It may that we have to do that virtually. Can we help with PPE supplies? We will never see people working with pay, uh, residents who are suspected or who have COVID-19 in an aged care facility not wearing the correct PPE. So if they haven't got it, we will help provide it until orders come in or um, from the national stockpile. Donning and doffing, um, the idea of actually somebody going in and watching somebody donning and doff has been asked for us. And obviously we will do what we can to support where we can as well. And cohorting of um, close contacts, that is a process that goes through with the manager, public health, infectious diseases, and infection prevention and control. So it's working as a team to identify those people who have potentially been exposed to COVID-19. The preference for Hunter New England was if people are diagnosed with COVID-19 and they are residents in an aged care facility, it would be to admit those people to a hospital in, uh, as soon as possible. We would prefer not to leave somebody in an aged care facility if we could take them out and try and prevent any further spread in that facility. I say that because nearly age, every aged care facility we've talked to so far, the first question is, would you take somebody out and remove them from the facility straight away? And the answer is, yes, we would in the immediate time. Naturally, if there was multiple locations with multiple people, we would have to change our plan and we have to be, all of us, agile in the approach of an outbreak. So as patients or residents come into hospital, there are times that we're going to have, have to say that people will have to be discharged and actually return to care facilities as well. And the other question is about surge staffing. So can we provide staff? Um, it's a magic question. Um, there is um, a lot of aged care facilities where there are multiple facilities have got very detailed plans about surging from one location to the other if necessary. There are agencies out there who are offering staff, some at exorbitant rates I would say, and they're offering staff to come and work in aged care facilities. But we do know that they soon become overwhelmed. And so we have developed plans to say that we have an ability in some situations to provide some surge staff. Now, it might be easier in Newcastle to be able to provide something like that or in the Lower Hunter region, but in more remote locations, it might be more difficult. And it also depends if we're providing two or three or if people are asking us to provide tens at that stage. 
Um, we are aware and we have had feedback of aged care facilities losing their staff. So we're not, uh, we're not trying to put our heads in the sand by any means. We know that St Basil's in Victoria lost 95% of their staff immediately. Of course, we're not going to see residents left in place, not having people provide care for them as well. We know that many facilities staff have told them that they wouldn't continue to work for them because they can go off and get other paid work at that stage. And I think a lot of people we've found are extremely scared of running out of PPE and being exposed to COVID-19 themselves and taking that COVID-19 back to their families and friends as well. What we really want to do is work with the aged care facility, with the PHN and with the local GPs as well. It is going to be difficult in the middle of an outbreak to work with a whole group of people consistently. And the idea of having a GP lead for a facility is an ideal um, idea in my mind and in f areas where there are not many GPs providing care to one aged care facility that might be easier but we do understand some of those large aged care facilities where there are 300 beds it might be unrealistic for us to expect one GP would take the lead in that situation. Now just because I've been talking about aged care facilities it really involves us all to say about disability as well. Um, there are 600 facilities catering for people with disabilities across Hunter New England with over 130 providers as well. The difference is they're often care staff, not clinical staff. So when people get sick in locations where there's disability care being provided, we may have to think of a different model and remove residents with disabilities sooner because there might not be the actual care staff in those, those areas that can provide the care. So again, we're going through a whole process working through disability providers and really the questions are identical around surge workforce swabbing and what is the role of a GP in that situation. And I never ever speak on behalf of the GPs. I, you know, I just think we just need to work together if and when we do have an outbreak. I am delighted to say in Hunter New England, we have done a, um, a program of fit testing to ensure that our staff are well trained in using the P2N95 mask. It might not be as relevant in an outbreak in an aged care facility but one of the things we do want to do is keep our staff safe so, that, so they're not that third of staff that gets sick when COVID-19 is, uh, there is an outbreak in the hospital environment. And we have had a number of outbreaks in our hospitals. We have had cases in aged care facilities and we have had cases in disability. And I think when we've jumped on it very quickly, we've managed it extremely effectively. This programme, which is a seven-step technique of fit testing a mask, it's what we should probably, probably have all been doing for a long time, but ensuring that the P2N95 mask so many people hear about actually fits the staff's face. So when they are intubating and providing intense care to the patients with COVID-19, they're kept safe. And finally, I just want to pay tribute to the COVID Care in the Home team. Mark is behind me here who has been running the COVID care in the home. They've been providing fantastic care in people's homes for people who are getting sick in the community. And there is a centralised coordinating model for nursing, but they have been using the hospital and the home care teams across the district, community nurses, and probably many other people, including many GPs, who have been providing care in people's homes when we had wave one. There is a centralised medical model to actually make sure that people are well and to actually flag when patients are getting or residents are getting sick and need to be admitted to the hospital. And as soon as the wave one was over and they were no longer as busy as they had been, we got them working at the airport and also working on all the ships coming into the port to make sure that people could clear quarantine. And they have stayed extremely busy during that period of time. And that was just an overrun of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And I'm sure there will be lots of questions and I would remind people we're ready, willing and able to respond to those. Um, yes, go to slido.com, hashtag PHN13. Alison is waving at me. So um, our next speaker is uh, Dr Jennifer Briggs. Jen's a GP, I believe, um, operating... Does, Jen does a lot of work in residential aged care facilities and would like to um, ask her to give us uh, some of her wisdom and experience. So over to you, Jen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I've just been one of the GP contributors to the COVID-19 health pathways for aged care facilities, um, which we've been discussing. It's not my job tonight to go through the, the health pathways. Um, it, 
contains an enormous amount of information. It, it has um, drop-down boxes and links to almost any question that you might have from uh, the basics through treating complications to the best way to write a COVID-19 death certificate. I've also been involved lately in the Hunter GP Association COVID-19 Response Unit Aged Care Group. And that group has been working on GP involvement in the planning, preparation and management of COVID and non-COVID residents in aged care facilities. Activities of that group has included information gathering about the experiences in Sydney and Melbourne, conducting a risk assessment to identify likely problems that will arise in responding to COVID-19 in aged care facilities, and measures, working out measures to deal with those risks and problems. It has also been conducting exercises in aged care facilities as a practice for the real thing and analysing the results of those exercises. And the group has been looking at different models of GP involvement and contributions that GPs can make. Exactly how GPs should operate in the event of COVID in aged care facilities is obviously still being debated and needs more GP input. Clearly GPs are needed in helping aged care facilities prepare for COVID-19, in continuing to provide primary care for residents, especially non-COVID residents, but their role with COVID patients and the overall organisation of their services is not carved in stone at this point. There are several models for GP involvement, which I believe will be available to participants tonight. Um, we'll have links or, other, or else be emailed directly to participants at the end of this seminar. One's from the CDNA, another is from the PN Blue Mountains PHN. Neither is an endorsed plan or the received wisdom, um, but they could serve as a starting point for discussion. I suspect myself that GPs in a particular facility will work out a number of different ways of working that suits their capacities and their own preferences, and that some GP practices have already been evolving plans of their own. There are just a few things I'd like to comment on that I think perhaps need more emphasis um, in perhaps in the, the health pathway. Um, one is about a word about advanced care plans. Um, some some uh, some aged care staff may feel that the advanced care plan that's already been made on entry to the facility is sufficient, but I don't think that's true because aged care planning is presented to residents as in the future when you're in your final illness and you can no longer speak for yourself, and not many of them expect that to be next week or even next month. So I think advanced care planning needs to be specific to COVID-19 and to now. Um, it's wise to check that they've been updated because the aged care facility can think that the GP has done it and the GP thinks that they have and no one's done it. I think it's probably ideal for GPs to do it because we probably have greater capacity to discuss the costs and benefits of, of different decisions. Um, I'm glad to hear actually that there's now a plan to remove patients to hospital um, if possible. As three of the patients that I spoke to last night about their aged care plan wanted to go to hospital solely for the reason that they didn't want to infect other people in the facility. Okay, next thing is a few words about planning for a replacement of a large part of the staff, which may be uh, not quite well enough covered by Health Pathways yet. Um, you've heard, I'm sure, about the difficulty um, in providing care and the frustration of replacement staff when this has happened in Victoria. Um, I think we as GPs need to encourage senior staff at aged care facilities to imagine the facility being run by entirely new staff and to ask them to prepare and collate in a manual. 
the essential information that new staff would need to work the facility and care for their residents. And that would need to include things like a list of which GPs look after which patients and how to contact them, a map of where everything and everyone is, name labels for residents, photos for med charts, photos on the drug trolley if they don't use med charts, and identifying tags for original staff still there who can be asked for help. Certainly one page care plans for each resident, uh, because looking through 30 pages of tick box on the computer is very time consuming and difficult. Contact numbers for pathology, imaging, the pharmacy, computer logins and clear simple instructions on how to use the essential parts of the computer systems. The GP's part would be to encourage that work to be done ahead of time and to contribute to it by either providing a one page up to date medical history or at least a record in the facilities manual for new staff of where that information is to be found um, and the login details if it's on computer. And it could be on computer, could be on medical director, could be on paper in, in a, a file dedicated to each patient or it could be in one file on paper for, that, for all the patients that that doctor has in the facility. So new staff would really need to know uh, where that stuff was to be found. Um, it would help if that included the relative contact. Um, the advanced care plan, quite simply for hospital or no hospital. And whether the patient is insured or DVA might help too because it gives other choices. Plus a brief idea of functional status, especially cognition, mobility, and degree of dependence. We also need to provide details of where pathology and imaging results are kept and where specialist correspondence are to be found. Okay, another thing I'd like to stress is the importance of ordering medications and charting medications just in case. Aged care facilities have, have quite strict rules that dictate that they have limited stocks of drugs like five ampoules of morphine. Borrowing is, is widely banned, borrowing from other patients. Pharmacies don't deliver at night. So we need to, if we think that there is going to be needed palliative care meds, uh, meds for agitated delirium, um, antibiotics, if we think that they're going to be needed during the night, we need to write scripts for them, have them brought and chart them just in case. Um, I would also emphasise the importance of RNs having a facility mobile for every RN, for every senior, the, the senior RN, to have a facility mobile in their pocket while they work to, so that, and the doctor's mobile numbers. So there can be direct communication by text or talk between doctors and RNs. Um, Otherwise, you may find that you can't even get into a lockdown facility where the phones aren't being answered. And we've, we've all known the frustration of standing out in the cold in the middle of the night trying to get into an aged care facility. Something, and the last thing that I really want to say tonight is something that I thought of just this, this last Wednesday that should be written into infection control as both I and the, the RN put our faces close to the close to the patient with hearing impairment so that we could hear what they were saying. And of course, the only way they can hear their own voice is by shouting. So we've got our face next to theirs and they're shouting into ours. And I think we need to all learn with COVID-19 to stand up straight. And if we have, if we have to shout, even if it seems rude, that's preferable to putting our faces as close as we usually do to the residents. And they're just the points that I wanted, wanted to run through. Um, obviously, I'm, I can't go through the, the health pathways, but hopefully someone else will be doing some of that. That's it. Thanks, Jen. And um, it, 
thanks so much for those really practical tips. And I know the working group has come up with so many of those just from reading the various reports from around the place and speaking directly with colleagues in um, where there have been other outbreaks. And it's been really, uh, really practical to get some of those things through to them. Uh, we're not going to walk through the pathway necessarily tonight, but we we would um, do two things. One, encourage people to have a look at that. The pathways have been developed. They're really actually quite clear, these particular ones, about what's going to happen and when and where do I find the information. If you've got any concerns about that, give us a ring here at the PHN and we'll have either one of the primary care improvement team or one of the health pathways team come and make sure that you've got the password and that you um, know where to look for some information. So we do have a few questions. Uh, we've got probably 20 minutes left of the, the presentation tonight. So, um, but I'm going to welcome Dr. Tony Merritt, who's, who's joined us uh, remotely tonight, very socially distant. Hi, Tony. Um, and I'm going to throw a couple of the questions to you around mask wearing. So I'll bundle them up. So one is, um, should staff in residential aged care be wearing masks and when? And should people in disability services be wearing masks? And the third, second one, um, I might ask you and then ask some of the other panellists around, if we see people uh, wearing masks incorrectly, someone here is saying, I'm not in a position to correct that. Um, and what would our advice be for other clinicians who, who are visiting in a facility and see people not wearing masks properly? So, Tony, over to you. Great. Hey, look, great to be with everyone. Thanks for having me along and thanks everyone who's who's joined in. Look, the masks are, are an important part of our response, aren't they, in this second wave much more than the first. Um, one of the other questions that's come up lots of times, Catherine, is what, what else can we say about the Victorian experience? And I read a great document, I know it's been shared amongst some of the GPs on Basecamp, for example, um, detailing some of the Victorian experience directly relevant to this question. It talks about how many of the healthcare worker infections were attributed to workplace exposure. Um, and that's lots, of course, which is what we'd expect. But it has a, a, some snippets about aged care. I think uh, at the time they reported 140 aged care outbreaks and in 74% of those, the index case was a, a member of staff. Now, of course, infection has to come in some way. It's either staff or visitors, lots of visitor restrictions. So no great surprise, but it just points to how important it is to ensure where we can that um, staff don't um, bring in illness point, you know, and, and so remedies include really strict um, entrance place screening for symptoms, great behaviour in terms of staying away with illness. And wearing masks contributes to that risk. Now, in New South Wales, the advice for who um, should be, which aged care facilities should have staff wearing masks. Um, there are recommendations that are regularly updated from um, the chief health officer uh, until just, and those recommendations reflect local transmission risk. So it's not a, a flat yes or no answer. The advice around mask wearing for staff in aged care facilities reflects uh, an assessment that's updated actually several times a week in terms of uh, understanding of, of local risk, so local transmission risk. So we know for a while um, that Newcastle uh, uh, LGA, local government area, was on that list and so that drove a recommendation from the Chief Health Officer that all aged care facilities in Newcastle should have staff wearing masks. The, those clusters that we heard about earlier from Paul um, look to be resolved. We haven't had a case recently. Newcastle's come off that list. And I think, uh, Catherine, I think I'm right in saying that the PHN has circulated links to that list. Certainly, it's on the New South Wales Health uh, website where people can find. So, uh, mask wearing driven by that local risk assessment, it's updated at least once a week. I think the question about um, to whom do people flag concerns if they see poor infection control is a, is a fabulous question. I, I think um, that both in uh, peacetime while we're in this prevention mode and definitely in a response to uh, cases or an outbreak, we're going to need to take every 
possible opportunity to fine tune our infection control. Um, Paul mentioned having a buddy, and that's all about somebody else looking out and letting you know when something's not being done correctly. And we need to be able to do that all the time. Now, I'm not sure what the right escalation is in a facility. I imagine, so um, Jen Briggs, you might be pre uh, happy to make a comment there in a moment. I imagine if there was a you know a clinical lead, it could be through that. But uh, uh, one of your points, I think, was GPs cultivating relationship with management in aged care to ensure all those great steps you pointed out are in place. So I think drawing on those links, the question was posed by somebody calling themselves allied health. I, th I think the same relationship pathway applies. Too much for me. Um, Jennifer Briggs, did you want to comment? That you're asking, Tony? Oh, I just wanted to, uh, in, from your own experience, in, in terms of uh, escalating an issue within an aged care facility, if you saw an example of um, infection control practice that could be improved on, who, who okay. would you take it to? Okay, well, well I've been inclined to, sp to speak to the person who was doing it, as, as I did a couple of weeks ago when uh, the, we, we are, staff are wearing masks, um, when there's, but I saw one of the nurses actually unhook the mask um, so that the patient could hear what she was saying. And and I just said to her, when you, I understand why you're doing that, but when you're doing that, you're sharing air. And uh, I, I really think, you know, you, they they expect you to communicate with them. And I, th I think it's, it's best to take it up immediately um, but then maybe go to the the director of nursing and say, this happened, maybe other people are doing this, maybe you could emphasise this. Does that answer that? Thanks, Jen. I think it does. Um, I wonder, I'll just check in with our clinicians here. I suspect this is not just an issue in residential aged care. We have other people in acute also potentially with variable mask wearing. Mark, do you want to make a comment on that? Uh, yeah, look, I think uh, it's a sort of shared responsibility. And uh, I, I thought that, was a, that question was really well answered. And it's really, uh, it is a matter of, a, of, of how you do it. And, uh, but I think most people will actually appreciate uh, if it's done the right way to say, uh, you're wearing that mask the wrong way around, or I can see <laughs> nose poking out of that, and, and uh, so I think within reason it's our responsibility. While we have you, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm hoping you might be able to answer. So there's a question here about, and I think if I can interpret it, it's around uh, people uh, who have people who are in residential aged care with dementia and have. Um, where you might have a suspicion of COVID, but you actually, if they can't report symptoms, are there other things to be looking out for or any advice in that respect? Yeah, that's a, that's quite a tough question. And I, we went to a presentation from, uh, the, from people who were there at Newmarch House who had, that was a particular issue. And um, also, even when it comes to sorbing, sorbing people, it can be physically quite difficult to get, to get uh, a good, Swab. Um, so, so what was the exact question? Well, I was, is there anything else you could be looking out for, or what would, to, what would make someone suspicious that somebody who can't report symptoms might need to be swabbed? Yeah, I think it's, I, I think uh, uh, you have to be vigilant for symptoms because there are a lot of people who can't for um, signs. Uh, so, I think checking your temperature, looking to see who's uh, who's coughing. And uh, I think when you see that, you have to act act immediately. It would be a real challenge, wouldn't it? Carol, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think just have a low suspicion and, um, and um, swab early. And I think um, some of the things that's talked about in the geriatrics literature is just things like behaviour changes or, you know, minimal kind of symptoms that someone's maybe a bit more agitated um, and they um, possibly could have COVID. And they're... I think in one of the first New England Journal of Medicine um, articles, 
they talked a lot about asymptomatic versus pre-symptomatic patients in residential aged care facilities. And I, and I think just because exactly from that question, when people have dementia, it's much more difficult for them to um, report really mild symptoms. So I think that's one of the reasons why swabbing everyone is part of the, often part of the outbreak management plans. I was going to just add to that as well, is recognising all the other symptoms that people can have as well, because I think when we first started, you know, we talked a lot about shortness of breath and cough. One of the things I recognised when I talked to lots of the patients coming back off the Ruby Princess is how many people had a runny nose, how many people had diarrhoea, aches and pains. So I, I guess there was lots of other symptoms as well. Um, I think also from an aged care facility point of view, one of the things that the, a the ACE team did really well is they asked if there was a lead in infection prevention and control in each facility. And most facilities had a lead in infection prevention and control. So if you saw somebody not wearing a mask or wearing it in, in inappropriately, I think flagging it with those people so they can actually address it across the whole facility would be good. quite a bit of information um, that um, Jennifer helped write around assessment and management and it goes through some of the symptoms that you can expect in um, aged care facilities so there's another resource too. Thank you and there's a note here I'm assuming from one of our uh, clinical editors that says the current chief health officer advice for aged care facilities is uh, noted at the top of the um, COVID health pathways for residential aged care and we were also able to um, quickly add that to the capacity tracker um, a couple of weeks ago when there was a change. So um, it's part of my job to give a plug for that. So you know, if you if you're using capacity, if you're registered and letting us know that you need help, whether you're a practice or an aged care facility via capacity tracker, we can we can mobilise some assistance for you um, around PPE, workforce, other things. But if you're not registered, it's going to be a bit difficult for us to help in an emergency. So we really would um, encourage people to do that. Um, Paul and Liz, there are some questions here. I think you've answered them in your presentation because a lot of them are about would you take a, a COVID positive resident and you've been very clear about that. So thank you for that. Um, this is this. Well, there's two parts to this question. One is how quickly would um, assistance arrive, uh, which I think is going to be dependent on on where and when, and would the ability to transfer patients be the same in the rural areas it would be in the metropolitan part of the region? So the first one is um, what was the first one? How quickly? Yes. Mm. Um, well, as Paul said, within the first two hours, we would do a link up with the aged care facility and determine with them what they require. And we feel that at this point, you know, I'm not talking about when we're overwhelmed, as you see over in overseas and so forth. At this point, we feel really confident that we could um, have whatever was required at the facility um, fairly quickly, uh, almost, um, you know, within an hour or two. Um, Paul might like to expand on that after. But um, we, we, that's what we're planning to do and hopefully that we'll be able to do that because, as Paul said, getting that first patient out that's positive is our best way to protect our staff, our community and our hospitals. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's, that's what we're planning on doing. So hopefully that we can. And the other question was? Oh, it was transfer. about transferring people. Mm -hmm. Okay, in a, in a, the yeah. same plan for our rural sites as for our metro sites and we actually spoke to the rural GPs last week and, um, you know, we, we don't see that there would be any difference in this initial phase to, to what we've planned. One of the things I was going to say is about where we provide care. At the moment we have centralised care to some of our larger hospitals and that depends about the spread of COVID in the community, so that might change with time as well. And the other thing is we'd work with our patient transport service in addition to the ambulance service as well about moving patients across the district. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's too many difficult questions tonight, so that's good news. <laughs> I think we've had, we've, we've had so many of these and we've asked so many questions, which is good, but there are a few. I'm going to go back to you, Tony. The panel tells me all mask questions go to you. So uh, you didn't quite get to uh, people in disability group homes. Should the staff be wearing masks? And the second part, second question is visitors to, visitors to residential aged care facilities. Uh, are we requiring them currently to wear masks? 
So perhaps start with the visitors. Look, facilities have discretion to do what they um, need to do to, to keep their staff and residents safe. So there are recommendations and then there's kind of local adaption. Um, those same chief health officer guidelines that we've just heard are available at the top of the relevant um, pathway and on the New South Wales Health website, give direction for um, where uh, visitors ought to be either restricted or wearing masks where that's relevant as well. Um, so again, that's kind of on a, a risk uh, assessment basis. And look, disability homes, I, um, there's not a clear line of direction there, um, but it makes sense that the same risks will apply and where, um, where there's Chief Health Officer recommendation applying to aged care facilities, it would seem very reasonable um, to me that um, the same advice be you know, carefully considered by uh, disability service providers. It's, it's many of the same uh, risks that accrue, of course. Thank you. We presented to uh, the New England region last week. Obviously, that's never been on a list mandating mask use in a residential aged care facility, but probably half those facilities were already using masks yes. for all staff and all visitors. And what was really good is all of them were doing a daily assessment, or at least a daily assessment on all residents as well mm. for signs and symptoms. Thanks. And yeah, I'll finish with a comment around that as well. Uh, there is a question here, Jen, I will check, um, throw this question to you, but I'll just make a comment about it. So the question is, how do GPs register to become the GP champion of an aged care facility? Now, this is a, a challenge and for all of us for a number of reasons. Uh, the, all the information that's coming from the Commonwealth suggests, uh, and from the Ministry, suggests that this would be a good thing. And we think um, it would be a good thing, but exactly the logistics of how that works is something that we're continuing to ask the question and lobby the Commonwealth to say this is well and good, but uh, it does need um, potential funding. We've listened to our colleagues in Victoria about how it works and um, how they've managed to, to, man, um, to organise that. But Jen, um, would you like to make a comment to that? So about the GPs uh, well, communicating with the aged care facility? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, it's one model, and it it may work in some cases. It it really depends on a number of things. It depends on how many GPs have extra time that they can spend. Um, it depends on how much responsibility that person's meant to take. You know, it, are they a clinical lead? Are, are they a communication person? Um, it, it depends on whether a particular group of GPs, how much they want um, other GPs to be involved with their patients and caring for their patients. And I think we're probably up just up to the point where GPs have got to read different models, which is why we were going to post the CDNA model, the, which is a clinical lead model, and also the Nepean um, Blue Mountains model, which, which is a bit different. Um, so that GPs can start thinking about it if they haven't already done that themselves. Um, obviously, no, you can't impose a particular model on GPs, but if a group of GPs who service an aged care facility wanted to do it that way, well, yeah, that would be certainly one way of doing it, And but it would be a decision amongst themselves, I think, as to who was going to take that role. And maybe that that, that would change from time to time as well. Um, depending on time constraints. Does that make sense? Thank you, Jen. And um, we've spoken a lot uh, within the um, working group and uh, with others about, you know, recommending that the aged care facilities speak to the GPs who are um, working in their facility and discuss their role in an outbreak management plan and equally that the GPs who are working in various aged care facilities have that same conversation. Can't stress that enough and that appears to be the advice coming out of uh, Victoria from the ROCGP webinar and many other um, discussions as well. There's uh, only a couple of minutes left so I'm just going to oh, take a bit of licence and, and answer a question myself. Tony, it's about masks, so let's hope I get it right. Um, should residential aged care facilities have P2N95 masks uh, on site in case of an outbreak? I'm going to say yes and hope Tony nods. 
to say that should be the case. I believe we are re re suggesting that. Liza or CPAP at that stage. So, but I do believe most people have those in in their um, supplies ready to go, and we. Can it's part of the pathway, definitely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a question here about um, cohorting residents. We won't have time to address that, but there is some information on Health Pathways about that. If that person would like to follow that question up uh, directly with uh, one of us here, we will definitely make sure that you get some assistance with that. I suggest that. Um, if you're in Hunter, New England, you contact Ros Barker at the ACE team and she will uh, direct you to that, um, or you can just email me and I'll put, put you in touch. Um, there is a question here, this is probably to you, Mark, uh, around uh, what does the in-reach program, what does the in-reach support look like um, in the event of an outbreak? So, well, I think Paul probably addressed that, didn't he? That, um, uh, and the question is, uh, we can definitely su provide something and, um, and we can provide an immediate response on, on day one um, as to providing more people later on. That's a, that, that has to be worked out. But I think on day one, we can certainly prescribe, provide something, including people to go there. Because on day one, you need to identify uh, the staff who need to go and you need to identify uh, the people in the aged care facility who need to move and the people who need to be tested, you need to get that testing done quickly and the results back and we can help with all of those things from day one. Could I just add to what Mark's saying? So the in-reach program, as Mark said, we can respond very quickly and that, that might be an infectious diseases physician, it could be um, infection prevention and control staff, it could be health share for uh, cleaning and food handling advice. It would depend on what came out of that initial meeting that we talked about doing fairly quickly in an hour or two and determining what um, the residential aged care facility asked of us and wanted of us. And um, as Mark said, we would work with, with the facility to determine that in reach. Thank you. Um, we're right on time on the time, but I'm mindful, Carolyn. I don't think we've asked you to answer a question. Was there any closing? You've been very much a part of leading this initiative. Is there a closing comment you'd like to make at all? Oh, I think just re-emphasising the things that um, Jennifer talked about earlier, which is around preparedness, and that's what we really need from the GPs in terms of talking with the residents about their advanced care plans. What are their wishes? What are their values? Um, do they want to go to hospital, you know, getting their medication sorted out? I think that's the stuff that we need people to be doing right now. And I think, uh, um, as you've said to working um, with the aged care facilities on what your role will be and how, how you'll be involved. And the working group, as you've mentioned, is doing a lot of work on that. So there'll be more information to send out with checklists and things like that. But I think there's no, uh, for the last 13 presentations we've had, there's really no straight answer on anything is there. It depends and it'll depend on the facility and how rural they are and how many staff they are and how big they are and all those kinds of things. So I think the more we can talk about it and the more we can plan, the better off we're going to be. All right, well, mindful that we're, we did commit to finishing on time and we have addressed most of the questions. I will uh, thank the panel and, and thank all of you, and I should have done that at the start. The people who have dialled into this event tonight are obviously very interested in um, how we can continue to protect our, our elderly people or our vulnerable people who are living in, in residential aged care and, um, and I'm sure the rest of the community. And we were talking before, we've all been stood up and on high alert for a really long time and we you know would we're really mindful of that we we thank you all for what what it is you're doing in any part in uh, the the support for the community um in this time and um i guess you know we we hope that we're looking after each other and we're we're looking after ourselves because we're hearing uh, so much from people about fatigue and the challenges that we're all having with that so uh with that in mind i do need to plug the evaluation there is, uh, and this is one of uh, a, a whole series. We'll have a similar event on the Central Coast in a couple of weeks where we'll have the local health district uh, outline their response and we can hopefully answer some of those questions again. Um, but if there are other things you need from us, if there are uh, other events like this that you think would be interesting and important, please put it in the, 
in the evaluation. It's probably the only way we're going to know um, that this is making a difference for you all. So, uh, again, I'll just thank the panel. I'll thank our team here. Um, on, and I'll thank everybody who's been involved in uh, this preparation. It's been a really big group of people, but it's just been lovely. And I, I'm just going to finish with two things. One is I genuinely believe that we are in it together. And I think um, Paul and Liz and the panel have re reiterated this um, constantly, that we will be all there together to support each other. And I was um, in a meeting with somebody from one of the uh, aged care peak bodies quite recently, and they said to me, uh, if my mum was in a nursing home, I would hope that she was in your region because I think you're doing as well as anybody. So it makes me a bit teary, but I'm genuinely proud of the work we're doing together. So thanks very much. So good night.